Hey guys, welcome to the premiere episode of Match Grade Podcast. My name is Ed, and I'll be one of your hosts. Match Grade Podcast was really the brainchild between Dave and Matt, who wanted to create a platform for students as well as instructors on how to defend themselves and their loved ones. Match Grade Podcast has since evolved and includes content like product knowledge, training, as well as getting some valuable insight from the industry's foremost leaders. And I gotta say, the support has been awesome. Special shout out to Marsha and Eric, who somehow managed to find our Patreon before the podcast even launched. So some real go-getters out there. But guys, if you like the content that we put out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe down below. If you want to support the channel, visit patreon.com slash Podcast. Let's get to episode one. All right, in this episode, Dave, Matt, and I will be rating some of the most popular 9mm defensive handguns on the market. Each of these handguns are ones that we have either seen used in our classes or we personally own. So there will be no armchair reviews. Every single one of these guns has been personally fired by us um, at some point in time. Every one of these handguns will be placed into a grading tier. In case you were born before 1990, S tier is the very top, the cream of the crop. This is a gun that you can bet your life on. This is the one that you probably carry every day as your everyday carry concealed carry. Uh, below that, we have A tier. This is your workhorse. You know it's going to work. You've put hundreds of rounds through it probably at the range. B tier is that gun that you heard of, you got based upon its name, but you realize there are some better options out there. C tier is you were pretty much limited by what was in store, or perhaps you were limited by your budget. And then D tier is that gun that's going to be extremely prone to malfunctions, and I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot monkey stick. Couple of factors when we talk about grading these guns. Number one, MSRP, okay? Do I recommend purchasing guns at MSRP? No, not really. Support your local gun shops and they usually have some great deals. But MSRP was the only objective scale that we could use. I can't make a grading scale based upon if you get your guns secondhand, used, or maybe they were willed down to you. Second thing, magazine capacity is not going to be a factor. We live here in the wonderful state of New York where all of our magazines are capped at 10. That and almost every major defensive handgun does have an aftermarket magazine created in order to have extensions, high capacity, um, and things like that. Third thing, we tried to give you a nice range of guns. We didn't want to just give you 25 different models of Glocks and call it a day. So this is going to be a nice range of guns. If you know there's a gun out there that we did not mention or you own and you want to hear a review about it, put it in the comments below and we'll get to it in part two. All right, Matt, Dave, you ready to have some fun? Let's have some fun, oh, let's yeah. do this. All right, great. So the first gun that we have up on our list is going to be the Beretta 92FS. Ah, the old Beretta. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, the Beretta was actually one of the original Wonder 9s or Wonder 9 millimeters. Um, the Breda is a full-size double-action, single-action handgun, and it's from one of the oldest firearm companies in the world. Mm -hmm. The Breda gained major popularity back in 1975 when the U.S. military decided to replace the old and venerable you know, Browning 1911 you know, and decided, hey, we're going to use the Beretta 92 from now on. So when Beretta won the competition for the XM9, it was redesignated as the M9. Despite it being phased out of military use, it's still used for civilian use, police use, and militaries all around the world. Matt, Dave, where would you put this gun? Oh, you know it's retired for a reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but all seriousness, I mean, classic icon of the 80s. Uh, oh, yeah. Big, heavy, clunky, but a good gun. It's, it's reliable. So I, I like it. But there's definitely better choices. I'd give it maybe a solid B. So it was funny, you know, going back a little bit, Beretta Clone was one of the first guns I bought. It was one of the uh, the Taurus. And uh, it was... I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, everybody's got to buy their first gun, as we find out. Um, but the, the cool thing was, it was very accurate. It was also a forty caliber, so that was, that was just even tougher. 
But the overall design was actually fairly comfortable to shoot. The triggers were nice. You know, I had the frame mounted decocker, whereas the Beretta's got the slide mounted decocker, which I, when I played with one of those, I'm like, who would put a slide mounted decocker on their gun? And you know, the frame made more sense. All in all, you know, like it was, it was a smooth shooter because of its weight. The thing weighed like 92 pounds, right? That's for sure. Uh, so. <laughs> you run out of ammo and just clock the bad guy with it. I guess. Yeah, it was an impact weapon. Don't you run out of here, right? Or anchor your boat. <laughs> or you can anchor your boat or keep all the papers on your porch for flying off in the wind. So based on the history of it, you know, and it's, I guess it's standing and it's classic styling of it because it did have some cool lines. Some people would say it was a pretty sexy gun. It, it had some curves. It had some lines to it. It, it looked pretty cool. It, it actually shot pretty well. So the shootability of this thing wasn't that bad. You had to work out like Arnold Schwarzenegger to hold the damn thing up for a while. You know, yeah, I'd, I'd probably, where, where, what'd you think? Somewhere in the solid B? Solid B. Solid B? Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm okay with that. Let's, let's put it in a solid B. All right. Beretta 92 going in at a solid B. Yay. Go Beretta. All right. So like in the end, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about price here, right, Matt? Uh, yeah, that's one of the factors. One of the factors, sure. you know, because people, every time people call us, they're like, I don't want to spend, you know, a lot of money on a gun. So, you know, the Beretta 92... I remember when I bought my knockoff, it was in the 400 range, but the Beretta sure. obviously carries some name to it, and it's right in the, around the $800 range. It, it is now. It is now. Yeah, yeah. For Guns sure. have gone up. So we'll, we'll put that, <laughs> let's keep that right in that B with an $800 range. All right. So with the Beretta securely in B tier, we move on to our next 9mm. This is the Browning High Power coming in at $2,000. Ah, the Browning. Now, this is one gun that has a ton of history. Its design was started by the legend John Moses Browning, though Browning would unfortunately pass away before its completion. F.N. Herstel in Belgium would actually pick up the design and finish it just prior to the onset of World War II. The name High Power for Browning has nothing to do with the caliber <laughs> or the power of the bullet coming out of the gun. That's for sure. It just happened to be that when there were guns like the 1911 or the German-made Luger that only had a capacity of seven or eight rounds, the Browning was designed to have 13, so high power meaning high capacity. In the last five years, the High Power, unfortunately, was discontinued. They stopped making it paused, and then F.N. Herstal restarted making a modernized version of the Browning. Um, and I think the name is what carries a lot of that price with it. So, Dave, Matt, on three, what class would you put this into? One, two, three. B. 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 All right, B. defend. It is the John Browning classic, uh, second only to what? The 1911. So, you know, that alone gets it some cred. It is an accurate gun. It is actually one of the first guns you could call ergonomic in some respects. Oh, yeah. Yep. More capacity than any other gun, like you mentioned, of its time. And even today, the capacity, now you can get 15, 16, 20-round magazines for it. So it's kept up with the ages. Being single action only, kind of, that's the downside, especially today compared to modern striker fire guns. But, yeah, but there's it, still it, guys it, that live for single action, and, you know, that's it's a thing because it's nice trigger, <laughs> it's nice operation. There's guys that drive 60 Fords, too, but that doesn't mean it's good for everybody. That's right. <laughs> so, um, no, but, yeah, it is. It is a good gun. It's solid. It it hangs in there, and I, I think you could be well-gunned with a Browning High Power today. Absolutely. This is one gun that probably, if I had a chance to pick up, I might. Uh, yeah, it's, it's on my list. It's on my short list. Yeah. I actually have bought magazines for it, even in, though in I don't own one. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's correct. You know that you know what that's called, Matt. What's that called? It's called a gun addiction. That, well, yeah, got that. You're in trouble. Surprising. You're buying magazines and accessories before you get the gun. <laughs> well, you get the magazine first, and then I have this magazine that just doesn't fit <laughs> anywhere deal. else. That's so right. I gotta get the gun for it. Otherwise, uh, it's just leaving yeah, money that, on the that table. That may or may not have happened to me at Sig <laughs> last weekend. I bought some magazines for a gun I didn't have yet. Oops. <laughs> Oops. On purpose. Um, so the Browning High Power, yeah, you hear a lot about it. This is one of the first guns that I heard about when I first started getting into shooting. Yep. I did actually consider getting one, but it was at the time, you know, I didn't have a, a lot of money, and the price tag at the time was still kind of out of reach. They've always been expensive, but yeah. the one thing today is, yes, FN is making them again, but there's a bunch of companies making a bunch of knockoffs yep. that are actually pretty decent. Yeah. So 
but you know, it's you know the accuracy on it, the the reliability. You know, if we look at our criteria here, you know, is it worth the money? It's got the history. It's one of the originators. If you're buying an FN. I I'd have a hard time arguing it's worth the money, but it's yeah. still fun. But if you can buy the fun. Browning model. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. right? Absolutely. Well, uh, FN puts the FN in fun, right? Gotcha. That's right. <laughs> FN, you you got to put the you in fun. And I put the mental and fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, shootability, let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, it's pretty good. It's pretty ergonomic. It does work. I, I have shot them a few yeah. times. So my grip angle is um, great. Yeah, grip angle is fine. It's nice. You don't have to really work at it. I'm not sure about the current aftermarket supporter options for the Browning versions, but I'm sure FN's supporting their versions pretty well. There, there is more support for it than there was because of all the knockoffs coming out. Yeah. So, yeah. but you know, I, I, I you know, I, as much as I'd love to pick on the the Browning high power, you know, the, the as Ed alluded to, the misnomer, it's hard to because this thing, you know, it's like it's like attacking the classic. You know, you're taking that yeah. that '67 Mustang and you're saying how oh, it's a piece of junk, right? Didn't say that. <laughs> but Somebody end, might. At the end of the day, it's fun. I yeah, mean, that's the other part it's, of it. It's a good gun. Yeah, yeah, I'm you know solidly right in that B section. We're gonna have to, you know, yeah. maybe I'll have to keep an eye out for some more here. All right, so Browning High Power Solid B. All right, let's go over to Europe and we're gonna take a look at the FN five o nine coming in at about eight hundred dollars or so. FN, it's a Belgian company. Um, you probably have heard of them um, if you've heard of the P90 or the FN57. Mm-hmm. Um, so FN decided to throw their hat in the ring um, as a result, as an entrance for the XM17 modular handgun competition. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, it was designed in 2015. Um, unfortunately, it's not as well known, and I don't think it drew much of a crowd um, with the original FN 509, FN would redesign the gun for competition shooters in later years with the FN 509 Edge. And that would make a huge splash um, for both the civilian market as well as uh, law enforcement and military. Have you guys heard of this one? Have you shot it at all? Do you know much about it? <laughs> 509? Absolutely. Yeah, I've shot it. Um, I think probably one of the more underrated guns. I wish more people didn't know about it, but they don't. It's just they haven't gone, gotten out there. You especially don't see them around here. There's very little aftermarket support, which makes it tough for this gun. Less holsters, everything else. But I, it's a solid gun. It is well designed. It looks kind of cool, and it shoots well. I, I like it. What do you think? Well, this is the this is the time I got to chime in. Yeah, yeah. You know anything about this gun? <laughs> Actually, I know very little. I I think I remember seeing pictures of it, but. I've interacted with a couple FN guns in the past, but they were probably prior to 2015, so it definitely wasn't this model. I can tell you my experience with FN in general was good. It sh- the guns I handled shot well. They seemed well. They seemed to fit. They had some nice feel to them. They reminded me of some of the some of the Walthers when the mm-hmm. uh, when their full size nines came out. They had those curves and they had the dimples and they had a nice feel. To, they filled your hand pretty well, and I remember that. 509 when they're in the competition there for the modular i don't remember having anything to do with them but you know i can honestly say if they built the quality the same as the prior fns and they kept that standard they seem to be i i'd rate that sucker from my perspective probably a good c plus maybe into a b minus yeah i'd I'd give it i'd give it a high b maybe even into an a if it had better uh aftermarket support Okay. So. Yeah, I do know. I do remember here in FN is not great on the aftermarket. And the holster is all sales that support. Stuff. Yeah, they're Belgium guys. <laughs> Their primary export is Belgian waffles, not guns. <laughs> Obviously, jeez, all these and, FN and, and, and Belgian Malinois. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and, cho- all right. and chocolate. And chocolate. Yes, and chocolate. And and apparently guns, but but no one knows that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just so my my rating's just based on I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I'm going with the fact that if they kept the quality level up there, then I I put it in the C C plus to B minus range. I, I could probably agree with the C C plus, so we'll go All with right. C. So FN anchors in at our first C rated gun. Sorry, Sorry about FN. <laughs> Moving on to our next hand gun on the list, we have the H and K VP9 coming in at about seven hundred dollars. Okay, guys, let's settle the debate right now. <laughs> it's Heckler and Coke, guys. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I'll take a Coke. 
I, I don't know how else you are pronouncing the second word in that, but right <laughs> on the Agent K website, they say this is how you pronounce the name. So it's stop. a long O, not a short O. Right, right? It's, it's it's not pronounced how you think it's. <laughs> Just go with H and K. Right, H and K. Yeah, it's usually so, safer that way. The H and K, um, no stranger to handguns or rifles. Although they used to be a lot more geared towards hammer fired models. You're talking about like the H and K USP. Rewind the clock back to 1972, the Munich Games, okay? The H&K develops the P7 to replace the old Walther PPK. You remember the Walther PPK, James oh, yeah. Bond, uh, 32 yeah. ACP? I've got one. <laughs> um, so as a result of the P7 being developed, fast forward to 2014, H&K releases the VP9 to replace the P7. Uh, for those you don't know, VP stands for Volkspistol, meaning the people's gun in German, uh, in case it ever comes up in Jeopardy. Well, I'm going to uh, win some points on this one. <laughs> it's a very German gun. You know, we're talking about finger grooves. We're talking about the weird paddle release magazines. Matt, Dave, where are you going to put the VP9? One, two, three. D. B. Oh, all right. We got some debate here. All right, Dave, defend your B. All right, I have shot. I was I was actually the the VP nine um, actually guys that were shooting with us, and I tried it out a lot. I found it to be pretty comfortable. The interesting thing is, I kind of like the pedal release because it allows me to use my communication finger on my gun hand to release it, and to me, it seems a little smoother and more intuitive. Yes, it breaks the grip a little bit, but it, if it's working right, I, I like it. We're, we're Americans. The release belongs on the frame by the trigger guard. Okay. Just we so. have to embrace our international cousins that make guns for us. Um, it's but, a Glock for gun nerds. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. Well, that's why I rated it to be. Because, you know, everybody the, knows I'm, I'm kind of a fan of Glocks a little bit. but I thought you were going to say you're kind of a nerd. Yeah, okay. or could be. We're, we're all gun nerds. I've shot the USP, I've shot the Mark 23s, I've shot, you know, the VP9. But I can tell you the the USP was just a giant clunky. It felt like I was loading a howitzer on a battleship. <laughs> it just They were big, heavy and reliable, but yes. Yeah. It, you know, it's like I could almost see the it. slide in operation when I was firing it. Right. <laughs> Slow mo. You know, the Mark 23 was a little different animal, but when I got when I played with the VP9, you know, a bunch bunch of the guys we know had them, and they 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 swear by them, they love them. They they are a good gun. I just like making fun of them because yeah. the paddle mag release, and you know, they are kind of nerdy, but they work. They are very ergonomic. I've seen a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. They always make it through classes. They have rarely a malfunction. So yeah, my D That's was a little in jest, <laughs> but also I think I think if it had a, a frame mounted mag release that was behind the trigger guard, it would it would probably be a solid. Well, well it, it does. It's solid mounted B. to the frame. It's behind the trigger guard. Oh boy, <laughs> Matt wants the round button. He's a round guy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know the only the only thing that I would caution you on is I remember a few years ago H and K was very very dry on any kind of support. That's uh, true. Warranty work yep. and parts. The aftermarket stuff wasn't too bad. No, there's um, holsters and stuff available. Yeah, but, but HK will not sell you parts. Yeah, it's it was tough, and you know I don't know many armorers that can work on H and K. So it's either Jimmy none. the gun plumber, or <laughs> you just got to wing it and hope for the best, or you're bringing a gun in a bag to make it look like an H and K to somebody. Well, that's what that's what YouTube University's for, right? Yeah. So. Pretty yeah. much. But yeah, you know, my B was probably pretty good. I'd really agree. It is probably B. It is a good gun. And it's H&K, you know, kind of like we were talking earlier about the Browning. You know, H&K does have some decent history. Mm -hmm. They're pretty solid and they're well made. Every gun has its drawbacks. And to me, for me personally, it, it had too many. Every gun has its nerd, too. Yeah, so. they do. Yeah. German manufacturing for $700. Yeah. I know. That's it's a pretty not too decent bad. Price, so. Not too bad. Yeah, I think uh, it's another one of those guns that. Somebody might say he's like a little sleeper gun. So I would people agree. don't take it into consideration, but when you get it in your hands, you shoot it. Yeah. Uh, it it, it kind of wakes you up a little bit. It You're does. Like, okay. Hmm. It does. It fits it fits well. It shoots well. So yeah. Yep. All right. HK cool. going into B tier. We have a, another gun coming down the line. Now, this one kind of rides the line between Europe and US, and I'll tell you exactly why. 
So we have the Springfield XD coming in at three hundred and seventy-five dollars. <laughs> oh, sorry, Ed. Sorry. I'll let you continue. Uh, so designed in nineteen ninety-nine, Springfield's XD was actually manufactured in Croatia and then distributed in the U.S. by Springfield. Now, if you know Springfield, everybody kind of knows them. You know, they have a lot of history, a lot of U.S. guns. The XD for the Springfield XD stands for Extreme uh, Duty. Extremely disappointing. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I was going to make fun of extreme duty as opposed to like normal duty, like yeah, what, duty. what the difference between the two is. And clearly I'm recording with three-year-olds because I can't say <laughs> duty without them bursting into giggles. <laughs> he said duty. <laughs> but it was Springfield's attempt to make a modular handgun. So the XD series and specifically the XDM we're talking about, it comes in a ton of different sizes, lengths, calibers. It's interchangeable, and what makes it modular? You want a gun that you can have several different types of calibers and options without tooling up for a whole new gun. So just changing out the barrel or just changing out the slide, you know, you have a different type of shooting gun. This was Springfield's attempt at it with the XD. And the thing that attempt makes is it, right. Attempt is right. Attempt is right. The thing that kind of stood out for me is it's a striker fire gun. And why do you have a grip safety on a striker fire gun? That's for Matt and Dave to decide. What do you guys think? XDM, Springfield, where would you put this thing? Uh, In the lake. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, we got to rate it oh, one way oh, or the we other. We don't it. have it have in the rate. lake rating. What's the lowest rating? Mm. Ours is a D. So D? I guess that's it's as far a, as we can go. I guess it's an F. <laughs> wasn't matt the school teacher you know when the multiple choice test just oh. has a b c and d matt i gotta choose off those choices uh, i guess a d then yeah if it's multiple choice you can't, you can't make up your own right in a candidate yeah i i i gotta go with a solid d so this gun does not know what it wants to be it's a strike and fire gun as ed alluded to with a grip safety that is so thin, no one's hand can work it right. If you want follow-up shots, you may or may not get them. And it just is ugly as sin. People will rip on clocks for being ugly. The XD is even uglier. Uh, I'm sorry, but I've seen enough of these. I've seen a lot of them. They're not super, super reliable, especially because of that grip safety. And yet people buy them because why? They're $375 or less. So, yeah. What do you think? Uh, well, I think there's a reason why it's 375. They couldn't charge any less. Or more. <laughs> <laughs> <Cha -ching. laughs> they couldn't figure out how to charge less and make money off that, it. That's right. Um, you you kind of hit it on the head. I've shot the 9mm versions. I've shot the 40s. God, There were some 45s. Those things, uh, uh, I, I, that's about all I can say about that. I just don't think it's a good gun. You know, the grip safety thing, It was. I think the gun is confused as to what it's trying to do. You know, they wanted to add some safety features, and that's okay. It just, they didn't work right. It, it just doesn't work as a package for whatever yeah. reason. with the proper grip, if you did like an over, you know, put your thumb over the back, which we told people not to do, you can actually squeeze your gun hand and probably get the disengagement on the safety. Every time. Every time. You know, I think they tried to copy the 1911, but they didn't want to copy the 1911, and they came up with an abor you know, just an aborted attempt. It, it's a Glock that wants to be a 1911. Which is crazy because Springfield makes good 1911. Yes, they, they do. Yeah. They do. do. What engineer came up with this thing? I hope they fired him. So yeah, I wait, hope they I, just got rid I of him. I hope they fired the guy that came up with the kit that they come with. With well, the holster and the, the magazine sport kit holder. The sport and, kit. And the magazine holders that put them at almost 45 degree angles <laughs> to each other. To each other. Right? Yeah. It looks like a V-twin engine in there. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and you got to put one in backwards. <laughs> That's right. But wait, we're supposed to talk about the guns, not the accessories. <laughs> They sold it as a package. Uh, well, it comes with a gun, right? right? The case looked pretty nice. The case was pretty cool. Uh -oh. I may um, have some of those cases I use for other guns. Yeah. I think it makes the guns feel better. The XD, sorry, folks. If nope. you own an XD, again, I'll preface the rest of our decisions with, these are guns we've got experience with. These are yeah. guns that we've seen on the range and we've worked with or we've shot. We're telling you straight from the range and straight from our experience working with people on the range what our thoughts are. And I know a lot of people, they have an emotional connection to the gun they bought. You know, one of my first guns is on here, and we'll talk about it when we <laughs> – or a version of it's on here. Yep. You know, and I, I do have some affinity to it, and I wish, you know, I could buy it again. That, that I wish yeah. I could buy that gun back because I like it. I don't carry the first gun I bought. 
right? Nope. But I've we kept evolved. it because it's the first yeah, gun I bought we myself. Evolved. Heck, I've gone through four generations of Glocks and, yeah. you know, a couple different SIGs. So we're all over the map on and, this. But. And at that 375 price point, that's, you know, yeah. people are going to buy that as their first gun. Yes. People are going to buy it because it's cheap. It's a cheap entry. It's probably been sitting in the gun case since the day it was made. Five years ago? Six Five years or ago. ten years ago or whenever. You know, I can tell you, you know, my wife's got one in 40 that she had to pick up because of influence from somebody else. And I think it hasn't come out of the safe in 10 years. So you can't even trade that in. Have we, have we beat this one to death enough, Ed? I mean, think a I, I kind of tuned left down on this? a few, you know, minutes ago, but uh, we're so, <laughs> we, we are so sorry, Springfield. This, this is not a great gun in our humble opinion. I mean, you are getting what you pay for. I would say, yeah, for 375, you are getting a really not great gun, guys. If there's one piece of advice amongst the many pieces of advice we're going to give you, you get what you pay for, shell out some decent money for a reliable exactly. gun. Cause exactly. Because your life may depend on it. So after beating the Springfield XDM down to a pulp, so sorry again for that Springfield. Sorry guys, we're not we're not going to get any sponsorship out of them. Sorry, uh, not sorry. We're not going to get sponsorship out out of this at all. But, you know, <laughs> that's besides the point. Hey, we're doing it for the fun. We're moving on to our first competition gun, and there's some debate about whether competition guns are great for home defense or not. This is the CZ Shadow 2. The CZ Shadow 2, it's one of those competition guns I would say that is good right out of the box without having to do any modifications to it. CZ being the Czechoslovakian gun company, it stands for, and pardon my Czechoslovakian, <laughs> Česka Zabrovnika. Yeah, butchered that one. There might not be an N in there, but it's a good try. Yeah. Yep, and we're just going to call it CZ for the rest of this episode. <laughs> we'll get comments on that. Just so, like the H&K, we're going to just say CZ. Exactly. <laughs> so the CZ Shadow 2, it was developed in 2016 by the Czech Ipsic team, the uh, competition international pistol shooting sports. <laughs> Those guys um, can shoot. Yep, and uh, that was designed off of the original CZ-75, probably one of the most popular double-action, single-action handguns in Europe, and it still kind of is. So if you took the CZ-75 and put it on steroids, it's lighter, faster, better ergonomics, though it does pay for it in price. So guys, competition gun, that $1,200 you know, price mark for it, what do you think? Defensive, that's what we're talking, right? Yeah. This, is, this is a gun design ground up for competition. Who designed it? The IPSC team, right? So in that vein, I'm not going to say, hey, this should be the gun you go out and buy for carry or defense. But if you got one and you need to use it for defense, will it do the job? Yeah, it'll do the job. Oh, you know, well, all day long. Absolutely. But at that price, who's going to buy it? Probably your experienced shooters who have been shooting for a while and they want something a little better, a little faster, a little lighter. So I think it's a good gun. I probably would rate it a solid A as a gun, but I'll give it more like a B as a defensive gun. You, you, can, you can probably do a little bit better. What do you think? Hmm. So I was on the fence between uh, A and uh, a little higher. A and a little higher? Yeah, like an Ooh, S. Oh, Dave has his first on the fence about him. Yeah. Wow, okay. So, and here's really? why. I alluded to this earlier. The CZ platform was... My second gun, the one that I regret selling, I bought, it was a compact, it was a 75, and it was, the thing shot so beautiful, the single action trigger on it was, you know, like that gun was built good as any gun I can think of. They all shoot nice. They and do. it's just amazing. Um, I've had Shadow twos in my hand, I've shot them. I'll tell you, these things, they almost shoot themselves. They almost shoot themselves. All you do is point it near the trigger and, and will it to shoot. Just think, you need to shoot, and it'll do the job. When Dave says that it shoots itself, he's talking about the gun is very good at shooting, not that the gun turns around and magically shoots its owner or the gun itself. I just have to put that out there for our, you know, less veteran listeners. The gun well, does not have a turnaround 180 kind of feature. So you've got this this thing about, you know, the self-driving cars, right? You know, like the cars drive themselves. This gun can... It, they get nice triggers in them, but there's a drawback to that stuff. I'll get to that. But they, they got a great trigger on them. That's it is just so smooth, that very crisp release. But also, as you know, as you said, Matt, this thing is built right for competition. Yeah. Okay. Right? That's why I was kind of on the fence. You know, like I would give it an A as a well, I'll give it an A as a defensive type gun, yep. and as a carry gun because 
I'll tell you, that thing is going to be as accurate as anything anything on this list. But let's talk about what are the downsides to this, right? Well, the downsides are it's you know it's going to come with a very very nice trigger, which means very it's light. not. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's not that standard four and a half to five pound range. Right. Exactly. You know, this thing's down into the two and a half to three pounders. Yeah, two and a half to ones I've shot. And I've shot some some that I think as soon as it felt the heat from my finger coming towards the trigger, the thing was going to go off. It was just so well yep. tuned. But that's a, that's a purpose built gun. It is. Um, there are some guns that are purpose built strictly for defensive. They're, we're going to talk about some of those. But this thing, this thing was built like Ed said from the ground up to just spank everything that yep. it comes across in competition. Yep. I and love CZs. That thing I mean, is working. Especially, you know, this is a CZ on steroids, as I say. Oh, yeah. It's a great gun, but I hesitate as a defensive mm -hmm. gun. I've got a pretty old CZ-75B, you know, its its predecessor sitting in my safe that needs a little work. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking, I got to get that thing out and get it to a smith and get it tuned. The, you know, like the one I had, I carried it for a while. It was a metal frame, so the weight was weighing on me a little bit. But I'll tell you, the weight can be an advantage to that small, comp, you know, it was a yeah. mid-size 9 millimeter. But the full-size ones, you know, I don't know. They're, they're coming out with polymer frames or they had polymer frames for a while. And then, you know, that changed the weight ratio. Yep. It made it a little more carryable. Alloy like this is shadow, so oh yeah, lightens it up. Yeah, so you know, as a carry gun, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna twist that up a little bit. As a carry gun, I'm gonna give it an A because that thing, it's I would say it's reliable. It's it's good. As a you know, as just an overall gun for you know, like we're looking at our values here, you know, price to gun ratio. Honestly, if I was looking for a competition gun, that's probably the a good entry level price to get into a competition oh, yeah. gun. I'd go there. Absolutely. So the price on that thing, yep. you know, like I've seen some guns, you know, right out of the box, they're almost three thousand dollars. This thing, this thing can give them a run for the money at twelve hundred bucks. Absolutely. Maybe a little bit of work, but it's ready to go. Not much. So yeah, that's why I, I was on the fence on it. So you know, we'll we'll see what Ed wants to do with it. Maybe he'll just oh. kind of blend it a little bit. I'll, de I'll defer. You know, I I agree, it's a great gun. So we we can put it in that A category. So we'll put the CZ Shadow 2 in A category yeah, because yeah. it is important to look good while you are defending yourself. That's so. right. Yeah, I would say it sits more in the A than the S. We'll go, we'll go with that. So, All right, so the CZ being in a solid A tier, let's bring it back to America with an American-made gun. Hey, America. America. We're looking at the Smith & Wesson Shield EZ coming in at just about $500. This one's kind of rare because in a world of polymer striker fire guns, this is truly a rare double action only handgun. It is not striker fired. Now, Smith & Wesson had advertised this as the easy to rack, the easy to load because of the unique thumb assist, you know, for the magazines. This was supposed to be the one that was geared a little bit towards less experienced shooters, even women, you know, as a result. And part of a polymer gun is just getting that slide to rack. And sometimes, you know, either the leverage isn't there or the strength isn't there. And for you physics nerds, you know, if you pull back on a strike of fire slide, you're pulling directly against the tension of both the recoil spring plus everything that's resisting against that in the striker components of the slide. If you were to pop open the Shield EZ and you look at the slide, you'll notice there's a big old hole where normally the striker is and the striker components, you know, would extend all the way to the end. The Shield EZ is also kind of unique because it has a weird grip safety that we talked about uh, back with the Springfield XD series, but I'm sure given the looks that Matt and Dave are giving me that they are going to pound this one into the ground. I'm We're a little scared. We're just sitting here patiently listening what? to you cover the details on it. All right, guys. <laughs> Without further ado, let's tear this thing. Where are we putting this? You want You want to go first? Let's, no, let's do three, two, one. Okay, three, two, one. D. D <laughs> oh, there was no argument on that one, yeah. guys. All right, so, go ahead. Let's beat this down. All right, you go first, and sure. then I'll throw my, okay. my notes on this. So this is a gun that I was excited about when I heard about it before it was officially released. I want to like this gun. I really do. I want to recommend this gun because of everything you said about it being easy to rack and easy to load. We have a lot of clients who are older people that have arthritis or just smaller statured people that uh, you know really struggle loading the guns and racking the slide. So I want to recommend it. I want to like it. 
And this gun has been a huge disappointment. It's had reliability issues almost every time I see it on the range. And that that uh, grip safety is just ridiculous. Uh, the XD, we kind of talked about having the grip safety that was hard to use. The Shield EZ is about impossible to reliably use and get good follow-up shots. So for that reason, I just, I can't, I can't like this gun. Now, on the grip safety, and this could be an internet kind of meme thing, but what do you guys think about those people who like to put the rubber bands or the rubber, you know, the ranger bands around the grip safety to make sure it's, you know, completely depressed? Doesn't that kind of take that issue out of it? Well, yes. And well, it it's a big safety other, issue. It creates other issues. <laughs> you know, they're circumventing a safety design of the gun. If they don't like the grip safety, here's a solution, guys. Sell the gun to somebody who doesn't know anything. And get a good gun. That's the only person that's going to buy it. Well, exactly. And that's what we've been finding. So Correct. my two cents on this guy. I actually, you know, I'm, we're making notes here. And I put a C next to it. And, you know, when I when Matt earlier was like, a C. <laughs> C. And I said, and, and but here's why. I skipped over the EZ. I just thought, I just read Smith oh. & Wesson Shield. Which oh, shield I would give a C animal. or a B all day long. But yeah. the EZ Shield. Mm, Matt covered a bunch of, you know, you you talked about a bunch of stuff. Um, I've been able to interact with a bunch of these things on the range. And half the time, maybe half the time, they actually shoot where they're aiming. The other half of the time, they don't shoot. So I had one come right from the factory with the sights almost all the way off of it. Yes, so, I remember that one. You remember, I remember that, one? that one? Yeah. It's like... It just moved during transit. You know, the UPS guy was kicking it down the road to deliver it or something. <laughs> Maybe the dealer threw it against the wall to see if he could adjust it. The Easy Shield, you know, like Ed, what you what you kind of alluded to, it was meant to be easier to rack, easier to load, easier to shoot. And in reality, with the right technique, this doesn't matter. Hey, where but, can you learn those techniques? Oh, I don't know. I know a couple. I know a couple guys that do some training. Yeah, we might be able to shameless plug for our people. shameless plug for the Rochester, Rochester personal, personal defense. defense. We got to sneak it in there once in a while. The the easy yes. So there's a drawback, you know, the physics part of of guns shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, there's two ways that recoil is dampened. It's the mass of the gun and the mass of the slide right. and the recoil spring. You put an easier recoil spring in this, and it, which means lighter. Yep. So there's more energy going into the slide and the gun and thus into the shooter. It is a snappy gun. Yeah, yeah. it snaps more. And the that. problem with that is, is most of the time when, you know, like when I personally handle the gun, I can't even get my pinky on the grip. It's just too small for my yeah. hands. You know, and I don't have big basketball-sized palming hands, but I definitely don't have raccoon-like paws either. <laughs> so... But most of the people that I've seen get them, you know, like they're barely getting their pinky on the grip. And, you know, if you're shooting a lot and you realize the physics of the body and the gun, you'll realize you got to get your pinky on this to control out of recoil. Mm. And if you can't get your pinky on it, it's going to snap. It's going to jump. It's going to be all it's going to be uncontrollable. Um, you know, and then you go to the grip safety that uh, the grip itself is too small and then they can't get their hands wrapped around the grip so much. That, that grip safety is knife like. And it's oh, yeah. I've had people complain after like 20 rounds. It's like, that thing is hurting my hands yeah. right now. And it's just so then you can't reliably get on it. I mean, you just yeah. can't. So, yeah, well, Springfield's going to feel better because we didn't really beat up the, the EZ as much as we did the Springfield. Not quite as much. But it still deserves a little bit of a flogging. I'd take an XD over a Shield EZ. <laughs> I don't know. That's not saying a lot, but I Is would do it. Is there a third choice here? <laughs> so from what I'm hearing, if you have the right hand size, the right grip safety angle, and the stars line up just right, this might be the gun for you. Uh, it might be. It might be. It's probably yeah. a very rare person, but you're going to get you got to get one that works. Right. And because they don't all work. I've seen some of them that just, you know, after three rounds, they didn't want to do anything. Well, the physics thing, too. I mean, that's the other part. If you have hard primers or... Any sort of ammo that doesn't want to normally fire, this gun will not fire it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, like I said, I was going with a C because I, I quickly read it and said, oh, Smith & Wesson Shield. Yeah. I give it a C because they're okay. But then I then I circled back and saw the EZ, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's getting downgraded. All right. Smith & Wesson Shield EZ. Sorry, guys. Sorry, you are guys. going into Bye -bye. D. All right. So, we're going to take a break just for a second. We've talked about modular handguns and modularity of handguns and 
touched a bit about what the heck modular even means. So let's talk about the XM-17 modular handgun competition back in 2011. Strap in, kids. It's time for Ed's History Corner. Uh, <laughs> back in 2011, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force was looking for a new service pistol. At the time, the U.S. had been using the Beretta M9 when it won the XM9 competition back in 1985. Well, you can do the math. And 26 years of prolonged service meant parts were starting to get kind of eh, less reliable on the M9 as well as the SIG P226 that was being used in the Navy. All guns obviously have a shelf life. Uh, 26 years of service made 26 years of complaining what was wrong with the guns and what they could do better. Uh, so that's a lot of data. The Beretta M9s, when they first came out, there was no accessory rail for lights, no suppressor attachment options. It had a very heavy double action first trigger that we talked about when we were talking about the Breda 92. And an open slide where almost the entire top of the barrel is exposed instead of traditional modern striker fire handguns where only the ejection port was exposed. So these are all things that seem, you know, kind of gimmies, uh, the modern day kind of firearms. But, you know, back then, 1985, you know, they were trying to get the best gun kind of out there. Now, we talked about modular in a layman's terms, I would say modular is interchangeable parts that doesn't have to result in having to tool up a brand new assembly line for guns. So if you wanted a gun that shot both 9mm and Smith & Wesson 40, you don't have to create a whole nother assembly line. You can change out barrels and you can change out slides and you got yourself a different shooting gun. When the U.S. Army and Air Force decided to announce the XM-17 competition in 2011, they kind of put a Christmas list together as far as things that they wanted, you know, for this new handgun. They wanted to be able to switch between calibers. They wanted it to be able to support suppressors. They wanted accessory rails. They wanted magazine options. And they wanted a non-reflective tactical color. And as far as accuracy goes, it had to be able to have a 90% chance of hitting a four-inch circle at 50 meters. Why they wouldn't use yards is beyond me. I guess it was just to appease the Europeans. Regardless, there were a bunch of different guns that were entered into the competition. And our next gun was actually the XM-17 winner and is now being used by U.S. military armed forces. Of course, you guys know it is the Sig Sauer P320 slash the military designation M17. Interestingly enough, the Sig 320 was one of Sig's first striker-fired handguns. It was based off of the design of the Sig P250, and it was designed to be used in a number of different calibers. It was easily intercha interchangeable um, for parts, um, and you didn't have to tool up for a whole other different type of gun. Um, you guys have had a lot of experience with this. Dave, I think you just came back from Sig Academy a couple of weeks ago and had a lot of fun playing with this gun. Um, where would you put this fantastic U.S. service gun? Well, since you opened the door for this, yeah, I just I just had a chance to put uh, a thousand rounds on the 320. <clears throat> I own a uh, 320 compact myself that I've put probably two to three thousand rounds through, and I got that a couple years ago. Um, I like the platform. I really like the platform for its carryability. It's you know, again, we're going to price to gun ratio, shootability, aftermarket support. You know, that 320 is hitting all the marks on this thing. I'm on the, I'd like to rate it an S, but definitely in an A. But I'm, I'm like really kind of drifting up into the S category. I think it's a good gun. Even, you know, I understand there's, it's got its detractors. It's got its, you know, Glock had its detractors. It's... You know, all the striker fired guns took their took their lumps when they first started getting in there and they had to prove themselves. And I think the 320 has gone through it as well and is still working through some of the, its issues. That's a debate for another day, probably never on our side because <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to wade into that one. I'm still saying it's user error, but I'll leave it at that. The 320 system, when I first started shooting it, I, I was really impressed by how well it shot. And I was, it was a full-size gun. It was a big Big gun, the first one I played with a while ago. Then I bought the uh, the compact. The compact was beautiful. They do shoot well. I it's, they're that. just amazing. Yeah. And then you know this last iteration where we did a uh, did a course up at Sig, 
And we got to, I, I just literally, they gave me a gun and said, you keep it fed, you can shoot the heck out of it. And we did. We put, I probably think I topped at least 1,200 rounds because I got a few extra, a little extra love on the target. And I was very impressed with how it felt, how it shot. My, you know, after two days of training and 1,000 rounds, my hand wasn't sore. It was very good. That's that's kind of why I'm in the, the S category because this thing just really works. And the pricing is not that bad for what you're getting out of this. You know, we're in this the mid-600 range for a gun that is pretty solid and pretty reliable and pretty effective. Yeah, I can't argue too much with any of that. I'm in the solid A. I don't know if I'd go to S. I, I think they're innovative. That's the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. The chassis system, and you can basically build any gun you want. Oh, yeah. You once you f- buy one. Yeah. Yeah. Take it apart. Drop that chassis in a new frame. Right. Everyone's making aftermarket frames. If you want to talk about aftermarket support... This gun probably has more aftermarket uh, availability than almost any other gun out there right now. I think Holsters, there are more aftermarket parts than there are stock I, I, parts. I think you might be right. <laughs> you know, magazines are available, and the quality is good. I do think, as you alluded to, a little bit of the history kind of puts a little bit of a tarnish on it. The only bug I have with the whole thing is I wish it actually had a trigger safety. For a striker fire gun not to have some sort of actual trigger safety is one of those things that kind of I, I question – especially as an appendix carrier, mm-hmm. um, that that does not make me feel great. But other than that, I think it's a, a really great gun. Wait, yeah. so, Matt, you're saying there's no trigger safety. What what does that mean exactly for a striker fire gun? There's no trigger yeah, safety. Yeah, so, so, like, the Glock has that extra little piece in the trigger that is a safety. So you have to actually have your finger on the trigger fully in order to fire the gun. The SIG 320 does not have any system like that. So, so there's no safety? There are safeties. There's internal safeties. There's a drop safety. There's there's internal safeties, but there's literally no, unless you get the, what is it, XM-17, the actual military model. The, uh, the M18 model. M18 the model. Then it has the safety. a manual safety on the outside, yeah. but all the other guns have no manual safety or trigger safety. So. so that was one of the reasons why I pushed to host the SIG armor course here, because I wanted to get into the gun. I wanted that, to That's see right. You're, you're an armor. So. <clears throat> and yep. after the armor course, I actually was able to put hands on all of the safety features on the firing on the fire control unit of the SIGs, both 365 and the 320. And um, the only reason I haven't gone back to carrying the 320 or the 320 compact is I just haven't gotten it out of the safe. <laughs> um, but I was, I was fairly comfortable after the armor's course, knowing how each of the safety systems work in, in, in sequence, right? <clears throat> that the lack of a trigger safety, yeah, it's just something to be concerned about, but with a good holster, you know, like we tell everybody with any other gun, you get a good holster that good protects equipment. the trigger guard yep. and good protocol of your own, you know, good wetware, the, the brain, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Unless you have a so you're mechanical you should, failure. you should train with this stuff? Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah, you got to train with this stuff, too. Just checking. Okay. Are you trying to do another shameless plug? No. We just did one the last time. No, that, time. that was a shameful plug. Oh, okay. Yeah. The one of the things, you know, Ed was alluding to the modularity, and I can I can give you a great example yep. of this thing. I own the 320 RXP, which is the carry the X model with the Romeo Pro on it. I was impressed that thing came right out of the box, and they spent some time at the factory because the first four rounds out of it were hitting exactly where they should. Yeah. It wasn't like, hey, just slap a sight on this thing, send it out the door. No, they're, they, they're accurate. They did something yeah. to it, and they made it work. But when, uh, when I got the um, the 320 full size, or actually I was planning on getting the 320 full size, ended up with an M17 caliber conversion kit, which gave me what? the whole gun except for the fire control unit. So when I got home, literally that night, after driving seven and a half hours, <laughs> I took the fire control unit out of my 320. It's like it's like Legos for adults. It is. It's like a Legos fault. Popped it right in there and put the gun back together and I had a whole new system. That was a full size system. That's the beauty of this stuff. I yeah, was impressed. It is. I'm still going to buy a, a 320, you know, stock because I've got some plans for it. But now I can, I can, I, I can change that thing at will, and it's it's going to be awesome. Um, that's that's kind of why I'm I'm going to stick with an S. I think it's good for the money. It's very shootable. The manipulation of the controls is awesome. It's very comfortable to to use. You know, I'm talking slide lock, magazine release, everything. It wasn't a joke. The aftermarket material for this platform it's literally is countless it's unbelievable yeah. yeah it's just nuts you, you search sig accessories for the 320 online and it's it's the, crazy the world is your oyster at that yeah, point yeah pretty yeah. much so, so I, I will agree with you i i think you know you cannot go wrong buying a 320 so 
I can, I can put it in S tier. And ladies and gentlemen, we have our first S tier gun, and we just noticed that Glock Aftermarket Accessories has left the chat. Uh, <laughs> so what? there is that. What? But we, but we have our uh, first S tier gun. Congratulations to SIG. Yay, SIG. Continuing on, we have our first 1911 um, in the category. Yes, true 1911 believers don't beat me uh, for saying a 1911 in 9mm. I do know it. the original caliber <laughs> was 45 ACP. Shut up, guys. Blasphemy. So Rock Island Armory is your, I would call it your entry level kind of 1911. And it's as close to a mil-spec pistol from World War II that you're going to see present day. Coming in just at about $500 or so, that is not a bad price for a 1911 in 9 millimeter or, you know, in 45, I would say. There are tons of 1911 clones made by Colt, made by Staccato, all these different companies um, that range up into the thousands of dollars. But this one, our Rock Island 1911 parts, I believe, are even compatible with the original GI version of the handgun they really haven't changed much you still have your five pound trigger you still have your steel internals you know the the gun is a rock it was designed to do work it won two world wars clearly i'm not a 1911 oh, fanboy easy, easy, um, you, next you're gonna say it shot down an airplane but it didn't <laughs> I, I know we don't see a whole lot of these in classes, and we don't have a whole lot of instructors that carry 1911, but what would you guys say of this Rock Island 1911 coming in at about $500? I mean, the Rock Island 1911, if it's the gun you got, it'll do the job. Is it the gun I'd recommend you'd get? Probably not. But if you want a 1911, although why would you buy it in 9 millimeter? but if you wanted a 1911 for the historic provenance that it has this is not a bad choice at all they run they work they're fun to shoot although not a lot you don't want to shoot it a lot <laughs> um, it becomes less fun the more you shoot it but that being said it will shoot and it is a decent gun i'm going to give it like a a c or probably a d actually as a defensive pistol there's a lot better choices out there than this <laughs> My two cents on this one. Number one, this is this is for the guy who wants to shoot a 1911 without breaking his ammo budget. So, because well, know, 45s has, are expensive to feed. He, he has an ammo budget by buying this. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. People that shoot full-on 1911s obviously are independently wealthy and just shoot 45 all day long. But the Rock Island, I've actually shot them, and I was pretty impressed. I expected when I saw it, because this, this is not going to come over – as well as I'm hoping, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to lean into this and see where it goes. Oh, boy. You can look at some guns, and you can tell there's some tooling and there's some style and there was some work put into them. Okay? You take some of the other 1911s that are out there, and you can tell that, okay, they they did some work to make it look really they, good. They smoothed out all the rough edges. Yeah. yeah. With the Rock Island, the one I saw, it was like, okay, is this a prototype? <laughs> right? Is it like did they forget to polish this thing up a little bit? Well, you, you know, said, it had a very basic bead look finish on it that yeah. was, you know, you said tooling, meaning they left the tooling marks. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but it was kind of like just a like a bead blast finish yes. on it. And it was very but that was that old they were they were looking for that old finish from yep. the original 1911s, right? Yep. No showroom shine on this one. So. No, no, it wasn't it wasn't supposed to. It wasn't supposed to. This thing was supposed to be, you know, the original 1911s weren't built for beauty. They were built for workhorse. They were they were there Definitely. to put rounds down range somewhere in that general direction and hopefully save some soldiers' lives. Yeah. And that's cool. But the Rock Island was like, all right, let's let's see if we can make one a little milder than that, you know, mule kicking 45. And <laughs> let's put a little wimpy popcorn fart nine in there and yeah. see where we're in a, where in we a get. heavy gun. In a heavy gun. Yeah. And that's exactly what it feels yeah. like when you shoot it. That thing, yeah. it shoots flat because there's no recoil. The gun weighs five pounds. And I'm convinced, too, they run because the tolerances are so loose. That yeah. There's plenty of room for any dirt debris to fall out of that gun. But but they uh, work. So Yeah. See, I, in my, so in my opinion, we're going we're gonna to differ a little bit. You know, in our tier, tier system, I'm going to give it a B. And here's why. Because if you want a 1911 and you've got 500 bucks to spend, you're probably going to get a halfway decent 1911 for that 500 bucks if that's what you're looking to fill the bill with. If that's your budget. If that's the budget, yeah. I think that's a pretty good choice in a 1911 because, you know, you go into some of the other ones, the more classic name ones, you, know, you can go a lot lower 
and get almost a gun that would look better sitting on a mantle than, than on a, in a gun bag going to the range. But the Rock Island Armory is, I would say it's a good budget 1911, especially 9mm. I would agree it's a good budget 1911. I just don't agree it's a good budget defensive pistol. There's then there's that drawback. There's <laughs> right. that drawback because number one, you've got, you know, I'm I'm more of a fan of the intuitive guns. You know, if I put my hand on the gun and put my finger on the trigger, I want it to get ready to go. Yep. I don't want to have to be disengaging any, you know, combination locks and thumb safeties and dis you know, and you know, hoping for the wind to be in the right direction for the safety to engage, to uh, not not be engaged anymore. So I know Ed's sitting here just shaking his head. You know, I have shot safety engaged guns. I've got two 1911s sitting in the, in the house and I've shot the snot out of them. You know, it's like, it's just getting used to that manual of arms and getting used to safety on, safety off, safety on, safety off. The problem is most people don't train enough to and most people aren't make train that into it. Yep. yep. That's the and problem. I, and we've, we've seen it on the range where people come under like a little stress fire course. We, <laughs> we, we bring up the, the blue box of, of brain melting and the blue box of death and they draw the gun and they're squeezing that trigger and suddenly it's a 900 pound trigger. Why won't it go off? Because the safety's not disengaged. That's correct. So yeah, it, it's just, they haven't practiced enough. So, you know, a B for the, for the rest of it. But again, if that's going to be your carry gun, you got to do a lot of training with it. It's got to become intuitive to you. But I think the gun can do the job if you do the training. So I'm going to put that caveat on my B. Okay. That if you train with it, it'll be a good gun for you. So we'll split the difference. Matt's D, Dave's B. I'm going to put the Rock Island Armory in C category. I, I can go along with that. I'm I, okay with that. I'm okay I, with I that. I can definitely respect the, hey, you're on a budget, but you want a 1911. And you got it in 9mm because you want, you're on a budget. You're on a budget. <laughs> you know, it's, again, a you guys... Budget. Talked about it, but you got to work that safety. You got to get high up on that tang in order to make sure you disengage your grip safety. Can you train through all of those things? I would say yes, but pre be prepared to put the work in for this guy. Yeah. For this a lot of dry firing at the very least. It doesn't, shouldn't cost you a lot of money to shoot it, but you got to put some dry fire in. Absolutely. 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 All right, guys. This next 9 millimeter gun that we have comes from Austria, and there is no introduction needed. You know what? Wait, wait, wait. Is it? Is it? It is, Dave. Now, now it is. Time. We are talking about the Glock 19. Yes, Dave is a huge Glock fan. Oh, boy. oh it's a Glock. Okay. One of the most well known firearms in the world, civilian. The most well known. The most arguably well-known firearms, at least in Matt's world anyway. <laughs> um, it's used by civilians. It's used by law enforcement. It's used by military. I believe there's even a Glock-specific shooting competition in Glock shooting sports that they decided to do. So I'm not going to pound this into the ground. Basically, guys, the Glock 19, it's a shorter, smaller version of the venerable Glock 17. It's a little bit shorter in the length of the slide and barrel, and it's a little bit shorter as far as the grip goes. So the Glock 19 fits right into that kind of compact carry category, making it wildly popular. Concealed carriers as well as military for a secondary uh, weapon platform. I'm sure Matt and Dave will talk ton about this guys on three what category are you putting this one two three s, s. <laughs> how did i know that was big surprise <laughs> big surprise big surprise if big anybody surprise. knows us they know one gun to rule them all i'm done okay there you <laughs> go up. that no, was no, matt's two cents just kidding <laughs> more more like a nickel uh, seriously though i tell people that if tomorrow they said i could have one pistol one pistol only it, it would be the glock 19 it is just a workhorse it's it's not the prettiest it's not the most yeah, accurate. They're ugly. They are ugly. I don't care. God, they're ugly. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, but it works. Box. It's a box, but it's a box that works. And I'll tell you my journey into the Glock world when you're done. <laughs> my my number one uh, thing for a carry gun is what reliability, and yeah. the Glock is it's gonna work every time. The most reliable gun, uh, you know, almost hands down. There's some good com competition now though, but the 19 it's been around. It's proven. It works. You know, it's a good size for carry, but it's big enough for people to learn to shoot on. It's not so small that they're going to struggle with it and only get two fingers on the gun. So I like it. And we've talked about a lot aftermarket support. Yeah. Um, you know, the 320 is getting up there now, but Glocks have probably as much aftermarket support. I know holster makers that only make holsters for Glocks. So, you know, it, it's definitely there. As you can tell, I really do like this gun. I generally have no, one with pretty me vague. almost all the time. <laughs> 
almost all the time. I'm sitting so. here with two Glock fanboys, and I carry 1911, so, oh, yep, God. Yep. That's all right, Ed. But, Someday uh, you'll come to the dark side. That's my two cents. That's your two cents? Yeah. So my journey into the Glock world started when I, uh, years and years and years ago, when I got a job uh, doing nuclear security. And that was, I only had two guns before that. One was that Taurus. That's funny. That was my first uh, journey yeah, into the Glock world, that. too. It's like they shoved it down our throats and made us... <laughs> Love the taste. My second gun was that CZ. And I don't think I, you know, I think I had my, my first 1911 before that. When I started working there, I was like, what is this thing? It's a rectangle with a handle on it. Yeah. And then I took, then we took it to the range for the first time. And I'm like, wait a minute. There's something to this. This thing yeah. really shoots nice. It's, the recoil is manageable. And at that time, it was the Glock 17, 17 that, that I got yeah. introduced to. Because yeah. that was their duty gun. So the Glock 19. When I started getting into carry, the Glock, the Generation 2 was my first carry gun. And I, I thought that was it right there. That was the top of the thing. And then the Generation 3 well, came. Well, out. it was. It really hasn't changed that much. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, my God. Was I even born during Generation 2? Of Glock? You might not have been, Ed. Be quiet. I don't think so. So the, the Generation 3 was was a good, solid gun. They made it a little better. They've improved it. At, at the time the Generation 3 came out, it was rated the most popular and the most sold gun in the world right behind the Glock 17. <laughs> I wonder why. It's because the darn thing just works. It just, it's hard to break them. It's hard to stop them. They shoot when they're supposed to shoot. They don't shoot typically when they're not supposed to shoot unless you screw it up or you've gone in there and done your little gun plumbering, playing with all the little bits and pieces and screwing it up. Stock out of the box, everything except for the, the Glock sights, the guns. The gun is near perfect. That's the truth. <laughs> and, and the Glock box. What is that about? The Glock box. The old Tupperware box used oh to be great. God. That's a classic. Oh. I've got a couple of them. I think I'm just going to keep them. I, no matter I would what. take one of those Tupperware boxes compared to the new Glock boxes. Yeah, those are terrible. The handles fall off the thing, yes. and the, the hinges break. But the the Tupperware lid. It's like every time I put the if I put my my Gen two or Gen three back in there, I want to burp it like Tupperware. I've almost put it in the freezer a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> put some spaghetti sauce in it with it. That's right. But you know, Matt, you were alluding to it earlier. It just kind of fits all the it fits the target shooting bill, the learning bill, you know, the and then and then you look at the carry end of things, it's kind of like the Goldilocks zone of guns. Yeah. Right? There's certain guns that fit in there. And there's more, but you know, the Glock was one of the first ones that really fit that niche. Yeah, I think it was the first. There's definitely competitors now. And oh, yeah. there, and yeah. there are better guns today, I will say that. My problem is hundreds of thousands of rounds through yeah. locks. It is really hard for me to make a switch. Is that all you got? Uh, well, through Glocks. <laughs> so the grip angle is good. The grip size is good. The placement of the magazine oh, release. Oh, going to get dinged on that one. <laughs> uh, well, as long as, as long as the SIG guys aren't listening. That's right. You know the operation of the gun, the ease of operation. You know this thing. There's a reason why it's solidly in the S because it just it's, it's simple. You know, it's, like and it works. Yeah. I always tell people like if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a series of guns just for the for the prestige of having certain guns, you know like a 22 target pistol of some sort is sure. a good one. A 1911. Yep. Everybody should have a 1911 just because they're iconic. If you're a gun person, you should right? have a 1911. And you know people are gonna slap me around a little bit. I don't care because it's my opinion, and I don't honestly. I'm gonna steal a, a good friend of mine's phrase, you know, from Mr. Spalding. You don't know how much I don't care about your opinion <laughs> on what I carry. <laughs> Because I carry what I need to carry, and That's I right. carry what's going to work. And then, you know, I've I've bet my life on a Glock. Yep. Literally, yep. I've bet my life on a Glock. Yep. And that's not why I still carry a Glock, but it is. You know, because the other, they just work. The other thing about the Glocks is you can't argue with the cheapest, reliable magazines out there. How much is a Sig Mag generally? $40, 50 uh, It's in the $40, $40 yeah. $50 40, category. Yeah, yeah. And depending 20, on where you live, $20, 20 to 30 bucks for a Glock Mag. Yeah. Exactly. Jeez, I can't even talk about uh, 1911 <laughs> magazines have exited the chat at yeah, this right. point. But See, guys, don't you think that, you know, for Glock competition shooters and Glock fanboys like yourself, you're not really buying a Glock. You're buying a subscription service. <laughs> so come on. The newest Are you generation saying it's of, kind of like the iPhone people? Yeah, all you're doing <laughs> is increasing the size or decreasing the size or increasing the capacity. You slap another generation on it. You slap another mm -hmm. number on it. And nobody understands the naming or numbering convention. Oh, they used to. You know, but it's, true. So the one, the one thing, people, people do laugh about this, but 
every generation, you know, I've been around since generation ones. In fact, I missed a chance to buy a generation one Glock 17 a couple of years ago for a very low price. And I came back the next day to actually buy it and it was gone. And that, it, that would have been like the collector gun for me. Yeah. The generation one guns were interesting, but Hey, you know, I made up for it and I, now we have like 15 of them. Um, is, is that all? Yeah. <laughs> is that all? I think I lost count. I think you did. Every generation improves something because they, the reason they improve it into the next generation is because they, they need to make some changes. The generation three added the finger grooves, which were a hit for a while and then they weren't. And then the thumb, the little thumb thing, which personally I didn't like because I didn't think it was necessary because I never put my thumbs right there where they molded it. And then they added the, the accessory rail to it, which which that's was a, good. That's that needed. Um, to be done. They went to a captured captured uh, stage recoil spring, which made the gun a little more reliable, more more effective than the plastic, yep. you know, flat wound spring that yep. was just. It had that zip sound to it when you operated the slide. And if you're a Glock person, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't heard it, go find somebody that's got a generation two and operate that slide compared to your, your, your round recoil spring. And you're going to hear it, you know, and then subsequent gen, I know we're going to stick to talking about gen threes, but they've gone to gen four, which they made some improvements. And then they went to a gen five, which is my carry gun now. And they've pretty much ironed out all the weak links in the gen five. Remember, it's not perfection. It's Glock perfection. It's Glock perfection. I was just going to say that. They <laughs> always perfection. advertise Glock perfection, but it seems to be every generation you're chasing perfection. You're just getting a little more perfecter. Glock yeah. perfection. It's, it's more perfecter. But the, it, for for the, the price, 500 bucks. In fact, you can probably find a Gen 3 for a little less right now because they're all going to be used. If you find a new one, snap that sucker up. You know, for the even $500, I'll tell you, for an entry-level gun that's going to work right out of the box, maybe throw 100 bucks in sights on there, get some decent sights on there, night sights, or it doesn't matter. Just get something durable that's yeah. not the white outline. Get rid thing. of those Glock sights. You've got a gun that you can probably carry for the rest of your carry career and not worry about it. And yep. with a few minor maintenance issues, like the recall spring every three to 4,000 rounds just to keep it in tip-top shape. Yep. And maybe the on the Generation 3s, the trigger return spring, you could clean it if you wanted to, if I guess. You want, if you want to. Dave, doesn't your wife run a Glock that hasn't been cleaned in over 5,000 rounds or so? Uh, I can confirm nor deny that rumor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, solid S, guys. Solid S. Solid S. I guess there is a reason why it is so ubiquitous in the world and why there are so many copies of the Glock or the clones of the Glock, which is going to bring us into our next gun. Stay tuned. So now that we've satisfied or just opened the door for the Glock fanboys, we're going to move right along and talk about our next 9mm, which is actually a Glock clone. So when you get a bunch of guys who are a bunch of Glock enthusiasts to all sit down and write down everything that's wrong with Glock, and then make <laughs> suggestions to improve upon them, and then actually follow through, you create a company called Shadow Systems. You gotta give these guys credit. <laughs> so Shadow Systems is a smaller, it's a Texas-based company that only came out a few years ago, but they decided to improve upon the existing Glock models. They decided to use injection molded fitted plastic, they wanted to make made to fit slides, better sights, and a nice crispy trigger instead of kind of squishy trigger that you get in your Glockenspiel. If you didn't know too much about- Glockator. Uh, if you didn't know too much about gunsmithing or you're nervous about replacing any of the parts of the Glock, but you wanted a better Glock, that's what Shadow Systems done. It's a great gun straight out of the box. Dave, Matt, what do you think about this? I would say improved Glock. Gucci Glock. This Glock is for guys who want to carry a Glock but are too ashamed to carry a Glock. <laughs> oh, can, you, can you really call it a Gucci Glock for just $800? It's not that much more. It's more. <laughs> it's a it's it's somebody called it a copy that's more expensive than the original that's about right. <laughs> it does have a nice trigger i don't know matt what's your what what do you think you're going to rate it at because i got a feeling i'm going to have a different rating I, i'll actually give it an s honestly really you're going to give it, it an s it, it's reliable well that's what i was going to give it uh, now he's going to change his mind <laughs> I'm hesitating because he I, wants to say it's reliable, but I, it doesn't have the long tracker. That, that's part of it. And it, no, it's actually, it's actually he doesn't have the long tracker. That, that's also true. <laughs> but I do have a track record. And up until very recently, it was very positive and I saw reliability. But then I just ran across one that wasn't reliable and that's tainted the water a little bit. It's so, going to happen. Yeah. We, we all know that yeah. that happens. We've, we've heard of, you know, every other pistol we've talked about, we've heard of pistols that. 
you know, a lot of them run like champs forever. Yep. And then you get that one that doesn't work and everybody wants to hate it, right? And I've seen it with Glocks. I mean, I have to be oh, honest. Yeah. I've seen yeah. it. So I've yeah. had Glocks that didn't work and then you just end up replacing all the internals and look at that, it worked because something was out of spec somewhere. Right. And it exactly. just threw everything off. And that, you know, that might be the case. And I didn't get to break this gun down and see what was wrong in the shadow that I recently saw, but it definitely had some sort of issues. Yeah. And it was brand new from the factory and had not been messed with. Mm -hmm. So that spoiled me a little bit on it, but I've seen enough of them over the last year or two. I think it is a good gun. Yeah. I really do think it is a good gun. Yeah, I I agree with the S. I personally, six, six eight months ago, I bought one of the 920, uh, the ones with the compensator, 920P. Compensated, not with oh, the compensator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> my bad. And that Just for legal the, purposes. Now with the suppressor. <laughs> Wrong state. So I bought one because I had a chance to shoot, you know, one of our instructors, he has one. And I got to play with that. And I was like, okay, this is kind of impressive. This isn't bad. It's about the size of a 43X from yep. Glock. Yep. And I thought, okay, maybe there's something to this. And then I, I got to shoot somebody else's and I got, they said, you feed it, you shoot it all you want. So I was at the range one day and I just happened to have a little extra ammo. And I ended up putting about 250 rounds of this thing, just beating it up. I had something, yep. can I just run it? And he goes, Go for it. Do whatever you want to do with it. What I did is, you know, I have my my set of standards that I that I will shoot every once in a while to to see if I'm slipping on anything. I decided I'm going to run this thing through the standards. Mm -hmm. I did. I would say as close as I would want to be with that gun that I do with my standard Glock. But you had just picked it up, and, and I just it. picked it up, yeah. and it was probably 400 rounds into this yep. between the both guns. So that's what impressed me. That's what made me think, okay, this there's something to this. I would agree. Then when I bought it, I, I got the one myself. I took it to the range. You know, Wendy and I ran it. She's kind of critical on small guns, only because she just likes she likes the 19 size. She likes the 17 full size frames. Warming up to the 48. She's rocking that 48, really. I know. Yeah. But when she put that 920P in her, and she was just like, "This is nice." So that's something that's hard to describe and hard to make people understand, but it feels good in your hand. It does. It does. I don't. You know, if we look at our, our factors that we're talking about with the other guns, right? Yep. Um, so let's look at, you know, price to gun ratio. You know, it's in the $900 category. It's not know, that 8 to much, 900 And not that much more than the Glocks, yeah. but it does improve yeah. on the Mine my, my was about 825 so okay, you yep. know, right in the 800 I think I think it's a good value for what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, Ed wasn't kidding when he said that, you know, these guys got together and said, all right, Glocks are good. What could we do to make them yeah. better? Yeah. Right? What would we add to it? What would we want to do with it? They got a nice trigger on there. It is a little crisper, I'll admit, you know, but after some work with the Glock trigger, it's hard for me to tell the difference. And it comes with better sights right out of the box. And better sights right out of the box. You know, the ported model that I got, when you're running 115 grain 9, you don't notice it. But when you step up to the 124s, you, notice it. you feel it working. For most people, you know, you see the, I think one of the fads lately is you're putting that extended barrel and you're putting that that comp on the end of the end of the gun because everybody thinks it looks cool. You're shooting a weeny little nine millimeter. You're not getting enough pressure to get it to work. But it looks cool. But it looks cool. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's the main reason that we, yeah. one of the main reasons that yeah. we shoot good, right? Well, you know, you know you gotta if, look good. so First if we're staying with the defensive thing, I don't care if I look cool. I want to look alive. <laughs> you know, that's why I carry Glock. I'm not worried about what the bad guy's going to think about the end of my gun pointed at him. If, oh, that's a compensator. That's pretty badass. Thanks for shooting me with it. Uh, that's, I don't care. But, you know, the price to gun ratio, yeah, I think it's up there for a defensive gun. That's I think it's good. good. Yeah. Shootability, absolutely. Really no argument there. That thing. Even the little tweak they did with the grip angle. Oh, yeah. More shootable. Yeah. yeah. The aftermarket support. I don't know yet because I know the 920 didn't have a whole lot of holster options. A couple guys I know actually had to call a uh, couple holster manufacturers and they had to tweak their holster molds a little bit and make one. And then they ended up with a good holster and now they're putting it out there. So it's kind of like, I think the, the, the industry tends to respond a little bit faster nowadays because we can, we can move faster on things. There's a lot more options and holsters out there too. And they're more willing yes. to work with companies. Yeah. Yes. Yep. You know, before, you know, 15 years ago, it was like 12 manufacturers. Now there's 12,000. You got your milt sparks. I still got a milt sparks. <laughs> Same here. That thing is awesome. What is um, milt sparks? The Whoa, milt sparks. Youngins. Oh, <laughs> it was probably the best holster I got into at the time. Nice leather holster. The dual best leather snap holster. snap system. One on the front, one on the rear, kind of yep. like a canoe outrigger. Milts, 
they they just made a really good holster. You um, waited a year to get one. Yeah, the, the, the Versamax two and the summer, summer comfort. Spe- summer special. Yep, yeah, the summer, summer special. special. Those were probably <coughs> at, at when I discovered them. I was like, where have these things been all my life? Yeah, exactly. Um, and especially, here I am carrying. Especially back then, you know, this is twenty plus years ago. There was yeah. no or very few good holster options. Kydex was not heard of. Kydex nope. was just coming out about twenty years ago, and that it was, was the weird pinnacle. back then. Pinnacle of holsters. It was like they're folding sandpaper. Anyways, on that tangent. <laughs> <laughs> on that tangent, that's, you know, the only drawback is the aftermarket support. I don't know what it is, so I can't answer that either way. I don't know how good it is or, or if it's lacking. But still, I got to I gotta give it the S because that, that gun is just a nice gun. It, it's a fighting gun, too. Oh, yeah. It's definitely yeah. a fighting gun. That thing will run. I've yeah. seen it on the range. I've seen it under some very intense... Scale drills, training yep. and drills and that thing. I didn't see it hiccup once. Yeah. Well, only the one I've seen, and it was it one was gun. User error. It was one gun. Oh, yeah. That was. The only oh, yours. Gun. Yours was the one gun. Yeah, the one. The I, one, I one time I saw it didn't work. It was the user error. Yeah. So I can't blame the gun on that one. Yep. So hopefully, with being a new company and a new gun, and you guys. Glock fanboys aside, putting it all the way up in the S tier, I'm sure the aftermarket industry will eventually catch up to this gun just yeah. based upon its reliability and, you know, shadow systems. If they're doing as well as, you know, you guys are reading it, then I'm sure the magazines, the holsters, you know, all the sites and things like that that you want to improve on an already great gun will be coming or forthcoming very, very soon. Yeah, I don't I don't think the shadow systems is, is going to be a competitor to the Glock. I think it's going to be a, a an option yeah. for Glock owners that want to just, it's something similar but different. So Glock, don't don't get too worried about everything. And then uh, Shadow Guys, step up your game with with the suppliers out there and the manufacturers for aftermarket stuff, and they'll respond. All right, listeners, if you've made it all the way to this point, we are down to the last gun in our part one of the nine millimeter showdown series. And to no surprise, it is the Sig Sauer P226. Oh boy, here we go. This is going to be good. So. Ed's History Corner. The classic. We talked about the XM-17 modular gun competition. Now, years before that, there was a competition called the XM-9 competition that had started in 1977. This is the one that eventually Beretta would win and put out their M9. However, there were plenty of branches of the military, famously the Navy and the Navy SEALs, who didn't want to adopt the M9 and had chosen to go with SIG's new model, the SIG Sauer P226. Now, the SIG Sauer P226 is a double-action, single-action handgun. It was based on the older SIG P220, which is only a single stacked version and lacked the magazine capacity that the 226 had. When Six Hour came out with the big 226, it made quite the splash. <laughs> Navy joke right there. Beginning in 1989, it was widely used, wildly successful. It's still used in a lot of military forces and a lot of law enforcement and civilians um, to this day. This, I would say, is a working man's gun. This is a big gun. It is steel construction. It is heavy. However, it is super reliable. Unique feature of the SIG 226 was that it does have a decocker built in feature that's not shown in a lot of guns, but the idea is you've been shooting for a while and your SIG is now in single action mode with that very light light trigger. Perhaps you're not ready to shoot again, or you're done shooting and you're ready to put the gun back in the holster. SIG introduced the decocker as a little button that you push on the side of the grip, and it will safely drop the hammer without the gun going off and the bullet leaving the chamber, resetting the gun into that nice, long, deliberate double action position. So guys, rounding out our series, the SIG P226, where would you put this gun? I'm putting it in the A. I give it a solid A still. So I have to say, this gun is kind of near and dear to my heart because it was the first pistol I ever bought myself in the late 90s. I bought one of these. It was used. It was an old police gun. It actually is a little bit different variant than you were describing, Ed. Mine was a DAO, double action only. So it did not have the decocker. So it's just a long ridiculously long, heavy trigger pull (laughs) for every single shot. Yeah, And I rarely shoot it. I have not carried the gun in years, although I did carry it for a long time. But I'll never get rid of that gun because it was the first one I ever, ever bought. So it's a safe trophy now? It's a safe trophy. It's a safe queen. Yeah. But it's a great gun. It's super accurate. 
but heavy. I, I, I like them, though. If somebody had asked me what are my top two guns, it'd be Glock and Sig. And in, in some yeah. days, it's interchangeable. My first experience with Sig was with a 226. And I was doing some training and then doing some work with a, with a group of people, and their gun was the 226. And okay. I'll tell you, that thing, it was like shooting a dream. It, it was it just is. awesome. Once you got used to the double single transition, within about maybe 100 rounds, I was putting holes on top of each other. Yeah from double to single because that gun just shot very well. The full length slide to frame integration that they had just kept it so accurate. Yeah. Locks it up, keeps it accurate. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it was just amazing. And the, you know, the locking lugs and everything, you know, granted it was a heavy gun. It was, it was a steel frame, steel slide, but it didn't feel like it because it filled your hand very well and it was balanced very it's, well. It's balanced well, for sure. And I know all my Glock friends are turning over and they're, they're just turning this off right now. <laughs> but sorry guys, you know what? Everybody wants to think there can be only one, but this isn't Highlander and there's a lot of guns out there that yeah. can be good. This, the SIG 226 was evolved the classic line from, as Ed said, the 220. And yep. then previous guns before that. Yeah. And it, it was like a really good evolutionary step for SIG. And I think it, it really put them more on the map, even though they were already. Yeah, it did. And that gun's aged well, too. I think it, oh, yeah. you, know, you could pick one of those up today and just feel like this is a great gun. And now I just saw some new variants. Although that's the problem is that the original, just plain Jane 226 doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah, you, it's been it's been changed so it's, much. It's been upgraded, and now yeah. it's a you know a high end fourteen hundred dollar gun. <laughs> uh, you know, so so the it's cost, gone up a little bit. Yeah, so so your your cost comparison there that's a lot of dough for a gun that's essentially forty plus years old. Yeah, that they but put some window dressing on. So, there's a there's a reason for yeah. it though. You know, it's like it, it, you know yeah. going back on our list. There's guns that are older than that, but people are just like. Yeah. This is the gun, right? Yeah. This is we talked know. about high power earlier, right? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. an example. I look at it this way is like the, the 226, when that came out, you know, I, I remember reading about the uh, the battles between you know, in that in that test, you know, yeah. when the military was like, okay, we yeah. wanted to do this, we wanted to do this, and Sig's like, you know, here's our gun, they handed it to him on a golden pillow, yeah. and you know, the military's like, well, we're gonna go with the banana, and like a bunch of different branches went, nah. We like this gun, <laughs> so we're going to do this because this, you know, they made they made it more durable in the finish than Beretta did. Yeah, they made the internals pretty much, you know, pardon the pun, but bulletproof. Though those things were when the Navy adopted it, they went and they figured out how to make the the actual metal more corrosion proof. Yeah, you know, so they adapted very quickly. Yep. and even though they, you know, they they were actually gracious losers on the on the contest, but I think they won in the end. I think they won in the end. Too. Um, you know, when the seals and and I can't remember the other two groups. I, I know Delta went to the 1911s, and a lot of know. groups carried them though, or they were options for operators. Oh yeah. So, yeah, but you know, and in in recent evolution, you know, I've seen some of the the more recent 226s, mm-hmm. and especially the 226s when Sig has brought back the their version of the classic line again. Right, they're actually looking pretty good. Yeah. They're actually looking pretty they good. I nice was concept. I was tempted to like you know I've got a two two nine and a two two eight sitting at home and the you know the two two eight I'm never going to sell. Right. I I never plan on selling that gun. But the two two nine is like it's like a nice small two two six. But that two two six just has a feel to it. It does. You know you look at our again. Let's go back to our list. Right. Price to gun ratio. I'd I'd look for a used one on the on the secondary market. Exactly. And, and it would be a great option. It would be a great yeah. option. And the good thing is. If you needed to, you could send the used gun back to SIG and they'll tune it and they'll check it yeah. over and they'll send it back to you. And if it needs anything, they put it back in there and all you're paying is shipping. They'll go through the whole thing. Probably. Yeah. And if they find a major flaw in it, they'll tell you, oh, we got to replace the frame, but this is what it's going to take. Shootability. Yeah, off obviously. the chart. Yeah, off the chart. It's it's like your best comfortable pair of shoes. That thing just runs. Yeah. Aftermarket support, it's a SIG. Still pretty decent. <laughs> it's still, right? They still got still pretty decent. You know, I've seen guys changing the grip panels out or they're they're changing all sorts of stuff. You can knock sights off, you can put yep. sights back on, you can put all sorts of stuff on there. Magazines are available and yeah. you know, there you know. is still a decent amount of holsters made for that gun. Yeah. So, so that's that's why it's it's right up there in that A category because yeah. that's just a nice gun. I think just, if it wasn't 40 years old, I probably would have put it in S. <laughs> 20, 20 years ago, I probably would have put it in S. I was carrying one. But you know, other guns 20 have evolved. Years ago. Other yeah. guns have evolved and they've gotten up there. So they're, you know, the competition in that level is pretty good. But yep. 
Yeah, the uh, that that two two six man. You, as soon as I saw it on this list, I was like, oh, oh yeah, it's like that familiar friend that you could always trust. It's, it's almost like uh, it's almost like Sig had achieved perfection forty years ago yeah. and decided, why do you want to mess with a classic? Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, people say you know Sig is for is the acronym for simple is good, even though it's like the name of the company, but you know simple is good. They did keep it simple. Now, uh, from a personal protection standpoint, now the SIG 226, from what I understand, is a double action, single action gun, meaning yep. it has that long, deliberate first trigger pull, mm -hmm. right? So for new shooters or personal protection, you know, home defense, is that a plus, you think? Is it something that you've got to learn for two triggers? I know there are a lot of people, you know, especially when they go to class and they want to show off, they kind of preset that trigger into the single action yeah, not in our position we, first. We discourage that. So, yes. yeah, <laughs> tell, tell us a little about that and, you know, why, um, why not, you know? Well, I mean, as far as a double action, single action trigger, it, it, it's good and bad, right? The heavy, deliberate pull makes you really think about what you're doing on that first trigger press. However, then you have another trigger press you have to learn. So that takes, again, more practice. So someone buying a SIG 226 to learn it has to put time in and work in to learn both trigger presses and you can't cheat it by pre-cocking that hammer. You're never going to do it in real life and now you don't know how to press the trigger that first time. So that's a problem. The other downside I've seen with the 226, especially with new shooters, is the decocking. They don't understand that before they reholster that gun, they have to decock it. And it's something as an instructor we have to pay attention to and make sure they're doing that properly because the trigger is so light, it is dangerous when you go to reholster it, that hammer's back. There's an easy cure for that. It's called training. Exactly. And, it, yeah, and practice. Training and practice. So Shameless plug number three for mm -hmm. Rochester personal. How did my movie announcer voice come up? <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's my take on the, the double action, uh, single action trigger. And that was one of the things that I found when I first started, when I was shooting it, working with that one group. And, you know, like they just handed me the gun and said, here, we got to train with this. You're going to train with this because mm -hmm. you're going to teach us how to do this. I'm like, okay, let's cool. It took about 100 rounds to to really learn the double single. I don't remember the poundage offhand, but I want to say it was around eight to nine pounds for okay. the double action. And then it's about three for the single action. It's not the lightest single action, but it's still pretty yeah. light. The reset on that trigger is nice. The, the break on the trigger is nice. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to argue the quality inside the gun. Sometimes the finishes can be a little rough depending on the model you get. The one I had, you know, we were it was coming in and out of holsters. It was in the rain. It was in mud. It was in everything. Mine and has very little finish left on it. <laughs> it, it got shiny, right? It it's kind shiny. of burnished. It's and that, that's like something cool on it. Basically, if, if you're going to get a, a gun that is double single action, whether it's the SIG or another variant, um, you got to train with it. You got to go to the range. Load it, shoot double action, and then take a half second pause, and then shoot single, and then decock it again. Shoot double, shoot, shoot. Do that for a while. Keep working that, and just work it. And then every time you're done with the gun, you know you're working the decock, you're working the double, you're working the yep. single. You're getting all the critical components taken care of, of the skill right there. Then you you get to be shooting the gun a lot better, and it works. So you got to be deliberate in your practice with that yeah. gun. Yeah, got to be deliberate. That's a good gun. If somebody told me I couldn't carry a Glock today, I would not hesitate picking up either the 320 that we talked about earlier or my my classic series guns. I I jump on that in a heartbeat. Yeah, wandering the wastelands of the apocalypse, and I come across a 226, I'd be like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. For those of you who have made it for the past hour and a half, thank you so much for congratulations all the way through. Wow. Uh, we just got through part one of the 9mm showdown. Uh, we just went through 12 guns. Just to kind of recap the tier list real quick, in S tier, coming in at the top of the top, we have the Glock 19, the SIG P320 slash M17, and the Shadow Systems 920 series. Coming in second place at A tier, we have the SIG P226 and the CZ Shadow 2. Rounding out the pack in B tier, we had the Beretta 92FS, the Browning High Power, and the Heckler & Koch VP9. Down in C tier, we had the FN 509 from Belgium and the Rock Island 1911. And then at the bottom tier of I would not even give this gun to my in-laws, we have the Springfield XD and the Smith & Wesson Shield Easy Series. 
Thank you so much, guys, for listening in, and stay tuned for part two, where we go through even more guns.